I have three adult children. He graduated with a BS in chemical engineering at North Carolina State University. Thank you, John, for coming. Have a little floor. Here's for John. All right. Hey. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. If I start mumbling or anything, just say speak up. Um, but thanks again for uh, having me here today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, and then also some other initiatives we have with regards to reliability and making sure that we can always provide energy to the customers that we have here in Virginia. So these are pictures. There are two turbines located 27 miles offshore. Um, takes about an hour and a half to get out there on a boat out of Rudy Inlet. I did it yesterday. It was my 32nd trip out there, taking people out to see the turbines. So, you know, it's just an additional drive for me when I get down here through the tunnels and I get to get on a boat for about an hour and a half uh, before I get to my workstation for the day. But uh, these turbines were installed in June, July of 2020, okay? They began producing power in October of uh, 2020. And we've had very good productions. In fact, the production has exceeded what the models forecast that the National Ener Renewable Energy Lab had mm -hmm. uh, by a pretty significant amount, almost um, pretty close to 18 to 20% is what they're exceeding with the production. So that's been very favorable. And we think that that uh, can be attributed to the models um, were really done with measuring wind at the surface of the water not 600 feet up in the air, right? So there's going to be a difference based on that height. So we think that's that's where the uh, we're, we're attributing that to. Um, these turbines provide enough power for about 3,000 homes. Uh, they produce most of their power in the fall, winter, and spring. Think about when we tend to have storms and wind. Uh, and just like we all know, during the dog days of summer, when you wish that wind would be blowing, it's not going to be blowing tremendously offshore. So the maximum production comes along then. We'll talk about um, some benefits that came with that. So you, I'm gonna advance up here to the next slide. Um, I wanna talk uh, mostly today about our large offshore wind project called the CVAL commercial project. And that, that's much larger, uses much larger technology. So those two, those two pilot turbines are six megawatt turbines. Produce a total of 12 since they're two of them. And um, you can say, hey, wait a minute. Why didn't, why didn't you just go ahead and build this larger project to start with? We know there are a couple of things when we looked at it. And we just didn't think that was the prudent thing to do. Number one is we knew the technology would be... Um, moving from six megawatt machines up to 12 to 15 megawatt machines. So if you think about it from an energy density of installation, as well as operations and management, it makes much more sense to have turbines that have, these are you know two and a half times the power that can come out of it. So that was one reason we knew that was coming. Second one is no one had been through the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's permitting process. Some projects had tried in the Northeast and they were unsuccessful. In fact, they failed pretty miserably because Baum was very used to working with the oil and gas industry. They weren't used to working with energy and power and all, all of the aspects that come in with that. So we made that decision. The other thing is at that time, there was no domestic supply chain or manufacturing. So things are beginning to change as we move towards this. We learn stuff every day during our operations of those turbines, and we certainly learned a lot from the installation. Um, 176 of these turbines will be installed, and that will produce enough energy to power about 660,000 homes. So as you think about that, 660,000 homes is roughly 25% of our residential customers in Virginia. So when these turbines are at their maximum output of 2,600 megawatts, then that'll power about 25% of, of the base. We'll be scheduled to wrap up, and I'll talk a little bit more about schedule uh, on, on an upcoming slide. 
So I'll ask anybody if they have a guess of how much we paid for that lease in 2013. You mean the tax payment? How much Dominion Energy bid in and paid in the list on the for the lease? So one point seven million dollars. What kind of maintenance does it need, and how much of the cost, and how often does it need it? Okay, so I'll, I'll go through a lot. Yeah, of just save your questions to the end. Yeah, just so let me go through the slides. We paid one point seven million dollars for that lease. Similar leases are going for about a billion dollars today, the same size. So we were we were uh, very very much involved in this early on, and and looking at how to maximize the value of that process. Um, as we've gone through the schedule, you can see that we've done a lot of activity as far as environmental studies, as far as analysis of what it takes to operate, what it takes to permit, and uh, have these turbines be successful. So we received our approval from the Commonwealth of Virginia, the State Corporation Commission, uh, and we're moving forward now. Just received our draft environmental impact statement from Bone in December, and we expect to have a final one in September. And in October, we expect to have what's called a record of decision. So that is a, uh, an analysis that lets us be able to prepare to move forward. And then they give us the approval for the construction and operations plan uh, within 90 days of that. We'll start work in 2023 this year onshore in the electric transmission right of ways and then offshore next year in May, uh, in May after the right well migration season ends, okay? So the reason that we won't start until May is this offshore migration season. So in October, uh, the, cat, the mothers start going down to the Caribbean where they calve their young and then they come back up north. And so we can't be out making noise making activities during that period. So we can go from May to October with noise making activities. There'll be other activities, but it won't be putting foundations in um, and those types of things. So that's that's why that work uh, will take up. And the reason is that you can't do that is it's not that the whales would be hurt, right? I mean, you're gonna have a boat sitting stationary putting the equipment up. The challenge is they're curious. I always say they're nosy. They want to go check things out, right? So they'll get off of their normal migration pattern and stray out into waters in different areas that they don't normally migrate in. And especially in the spring, that's when they're bringing their calves back up to the, to the cooler North Atlantic waters to feed. So that's why the construction schedule uh, takes um, uh, three years. So one of the requirements in the statute that um, uh, drives us, the Virginia Clean Economy Act, says that you must construct the project with experienced offshore wind partners. So in 2020, Dominion Energy went out and did a solicitation. So we broke our packages down into these groups you see here. The wind turbine generators from Se for Siemens Gamesa, that includes the tower, the nacelle, which is where the generator is and all the controls for the turbine, and the blades. Then you come down to the transition piece, and that's what you see in most pictures, that yellow piece right at sea level. And it, it, what it does is it attaches to the foundation that goes into the seafloor, and it has a flange on top that the base of that tower anchors and connects to. So that's what that structure is, the, the monopile transition piece and the wind turbine. Inner array cable, that's a, a cable that's about seven and a half inches in diameter, and it connects six to eight turbines to an offshore substation, okay? And that energy is at 66 uh, kV. It goes there and steps up to 230 kV, which are just like many of the substations that you see around town here. Now, the one difference is these are gonna be located between 27 and 42 miles offshore, so they're going to be enclosed in a conditioned environment since they're out at sea. Then we run the export cable in and about a half mile off the beach, we'll use horizontal directional drilling and come up behind the beach so we don't disturb the near shore environment. And then we'll move on and I'll show you some of the details 
EEW uh, manufactures the foundation. Blatt has the yellow transition pieces. And then Blatt and Simcoe are doing the offshore substations. And these are all large, well-experienced European vendors of offshore equipment. Europe has been using wind for over 30 years now. Turbines are lasting well beyond 30 years that they have out there. All the installation, except for the wind turbine, would be done by a company named Deme, and they are uh, a U.S. division of Deme, and they're based up in the Boston area. And then Prismium will supply all the cable. So these are large wind turbines. Okay, the ones that are out there today, when the blades at its highest point are 620 feet tall. So they're pretty substantive uh, structures. If you go to a hotel on Virginia Beach, go up to the third floor and you've got some clouds behind you and just sun shining on them, you can actually see very low profile of the turbine. Right at, right at, because of the curvature of the earth, it looks like it's almost sitting right on the water, right? Now, the newer turbines and the larger turbines that go with this, they're going to be a third again as tall. So they're going to be about 830 feet tall, but they're going to go from 27 miles to 42 miles offshore. The foundations for these are huge, right? So they're brought over. These will land at Portsmouth Marine Terminal. They're between 25 to 30 feet in diameter and weigh 2,000 tons. And to give you an idea of the size of those, that blue arrow is pointing to toward two people standing there on the ground. So it's two little yellow dots with their safety vests on. Pretty, pretty substantive structure. There you can see how that transition piece is lowered down over top of the foundation. And then you have the wind turbines on the, on the right-hand side. So the blades for these turbines are, are just massive structures into themselves. They're, they're basically designed like an aircraft wing, right? Because you want to capture that wind to get the lift and have the turbine spin. And um, they are 108 meters long, or basically from one goalpost to another goalpost on an American football field. So pretty big structures. That's why they're manufactured right by the seashore. Can't really transport them on land, on land whatsoever. So the wind turbines start generating power at a little over six miles an hour. That's when they cut in and start. And then they actually cut out at 62 miles an hour. Okay, and so what happens is, if you think about when you were a kid, you would put your hand out the car window, right? The wind would push back. Well, that's what you want to have happen when you're generating. And then you would do it like this, and it's a whole lot easier to hold your hand there. So at 62 miles an hour, what happens is the pitch blade, the pitch of the blade changes, and it rotates so it's in a, a less loaded protect, uh, less loaded uh, condition and more protection. The heaviest lift is that top side for the substation, 4,000 tons. So those will be brought over and directly installed right in place. And then the cables here, there'll be about 300, 200, almost 300 miles of that intra array cable, the seven inches. And then the cable that brings the power to shore is almost 12 inches in diameter. And there's about 400 miles of that cable that's uh, included uh, in the project. Uh, so how do we get that power to our customers, right? It's all great to do everything offshore, but then how do you get that to the customers? So here you can see uh, we plan to come ashore at the State Military Reservation, Camp Pendleton, uh, maybe a name you're familiar with. And there we will go underground all the way to Oceana Naval Air Station. So right now, if you look at, look at that, that's where the golf cart house is at uh, Oceana, so they'll get a new golf cart house, and that's where we'll bring our switching station where we come from underground to overhead. So that's about four miles, and it's about 14 miles to go from Oceana over to our Fentress substation in Chesapeake. And one of the fortunate things about that is we already have transmission corridors running down a great amount of that, as well as the uh, old road that was planned to connect Chesapeake and Virginia Beach that was never built that both cities bought the easements for. So the transmission route goes along like that. So it follows existing easements and rights of way uh, through, that, through that area uh, with the exception of about a half a mile to a three quarters of a mile of new right of way that we have to secure to be able to put structures on. 
and run the uh, conductors. And then at Fentress substation, basically we're just um, almost doubling the size of that substation there to accommodate this. It is such a massive amount of power that we need to get that to our largest transmission lines, the 500 KVs, to move that power around the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so right now there's, there's a lot of discussion. So I just wanna go ahead and uh, straight up and address that. There's been a lot of articles recently you may have seen about some developers not moving forward with their projects and facing some challenges. So what's different about Dominion with that? Well, many of those projects were developed by third parties who bid for a lease with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, but then also bid on a PPA price with the state government in those states, okay? And the rules were kind of weird that they did for those. You had to have an increasing bid for your lease area, but you had to, in successive rounds, lower your cost for the power purchase agreement, okay? So these companies went forth and did that, but what they didn't do is immediately go forward and start looking at how do I contract for my supply so that I can deliver at those prices I thought I would have. Well, Dominion's different being a utility, right? So in October, um, once those pilot turbines were installed, just before that, we went out with those bid packages. So we were able to go out and secure our supplies and all the components at great prices before we had this record inflation. I'm old enough to remember the Jimmy Carter days, right? So we were able to secure our components and the installation of those before inflation took place. We did have uh, a couple of things, our currency exchange risk and some commodity risk. We hedged all that before the markets went up as well. So 90% of our cost today is fixed. That basically just means the contingency amount is left over. And that's there to address things like weather days. Think about it. Our biggest risk is weather, right? How could that impact us during our installation? So we're, we're very pleased with that. And right now, uh, we're around the $80 a megawatt for the levelized cost of energy. So uh, that's about what it will cost. And that's at... Uh, one of the lowest in the nation, and, and we're around the $82 right now with that. So uh, very pleased that we were able to get that locked in and be able to move forward. What, so, will, what will cause that to be raised at some point? So right now for us, there's not a lot that would do it unless there were just some catastrophic situation that we had more weather days than we had and you're paying for boats to be out there and work. Um, so that's a little bit about the project specific details. I'll transition now and talk a little bit about kind of the economic development and workforce development. So, you know, one of the key aspects we took was a three pillar approach to this. So first is how to attract foreign companies here so that they can set up offices and hire Americans to work on the project. So that's that economic development. Then we've been working on supply chain development and how, um, we can get adjacent industries to understand what offshore wind is and to be able to move in and support the project. So that's our second pillar. And then the third pillar is making sure that we have adequate workforce to support that, to support the installation and the operations. So there's some activity that's underway today. Uh, Portsmouth Marine Terminal there you see, um, and that uh, blue lease area there, that's 72 acres. And that's where all this equipment will be staged. It will be actually tested and it will be powered up before we get offshore. And the reason is, is when you take these offshore, you're gonna connect them and immediately they're gonna be connected to the grid. So you want them to be able to operate and be able to sustain themselves, okay? So all that equipment will be heated up and tested and that's gonna include everything except for the offshore substation will be staged there. And just behind there, Siemens Gamesa has announced a blade finishing facility. So they'll bring over from Europe what are called green blades. The reason they call them green blades, they're green fiberglass. And so when they come over, if you think about it as fiberglass, they're going to install some instrumentation in it, they're going to paint it, and then they're going to put gel coat on it, just like a boat, right? So it's going to be very similar. It's fiberglass is what the material is. But obviously it makes really good sense to have that right behind our staging area because as those 
turbine blades, then they can just roll them right down to, to go out to the project. Uh, just across there are Lambert's docks. You may also know it now as Fairwinds Landing. Uh, <laughs> and that area is, used to be the old Norfolk and Southern coal yard and for export. And they are repurposing a portion of that. And our uh, control center will be located right in that, that corner there on Elizabeth. So just across from where the staging activity takes place. So what makes it really great sense for the Port of Virginia and Hampton Roads to be an offshore wind cluster? So I'll show you a photograph in a few moments of how these turbines go out, but you need really no overhead restrictions and wide channels. That's pretty critical when you start taking these, these components out. And if you look at this, straight out of Portsmouth Marine Terminal in 20 minutes, you're at the mouth of the bay with a loaded up full vessel, right? I come down here at least every week, spend a night or two, sometimes three nights like this week. And I've learned that coming through those tunnels, music and podcast are great things because there's not anything you can do about it if you get stuck behind something, right? So you might as well just, just be at one with yourself. But because of that and the needs of the Navy to have that open access to the sea, that makes us very well situated to become an offshore wind cluster like they have in Northern Europe uh, and some of the countries because of the access and availability to be able to move goods out. So we're trying to leverage the resources we've had. Now, what are we doing to, to keep growing that? This is a list of companies that are involved right now in the offshore wind uh, aspects of the project and some of them onshore. So we're getting way beyond just those prime contractors and at looking at how that multiplies down through the economy. So Skanska right now is the port upgrade contractor at PMT because that used to be a container ship facility, right? Well, that container ship facility can't support the weight of a monopile that weighs 2000 tons, okay? So that, that port is being upgraded so it has the weight bearing capacity that's needed. But you can see, uh, we just did a ribbon cutting uh, over at Lambert's Point for, with Fairwinds Landing and Ballacore, Virginia Beach Company is going to be the one constructing our, uh, our, our operations center. So a lot of activities, even uh, Luna over there in the middle on the right, this is a company that uses technology to, to track and manage that health of the cables. And they're based in Roanoke, Virginia. So we're seeing that growth take place across the Commonwealth. So right now, uh, we're, we're seeing the benefits of working on that. That bottom right picture uh, is what will be built over at Fairwinds uh, Landing. That's our uh, uh, control center. So it's a marine coordination. If you think about it, there'll be 52 boats working out there when these turbines are being installed. So you have to have a marine coordinator. So we have, we'll have that. And also during operations, you keep track of everything that's going on, as well as our regular control room for the turbines. And then of course, a warehouse. So you can see the US spend right now is about 155 million. The majority of that again, being in Virginia, uh, clearly at 760 people working on the project. Uh, that have touched it and worked on it so far in Virginia versus uh, a little over 900. Uh, the really nice piece of that is almost 530 of, of those individuals working on the project are right here in the Hampton Roads area. So that pile, those pilings that make that, uh, that uh, quayside stronger or the dock stronger there uh, were actually made at uh, the coastal precast right over there at Cape Charles. So just across the Bay Bridge Tunnel. So uh, good benefits there. And uh, those are pictures of those pilings in the top right. So think about something the size of a large commercial uh, refrigerator that's about 200 feet long that's driven into uh, the uh, soil so that that uh, capacity can be upgraded. So we'll also have a little fleet of vessels that will be supporting offshore wind. These. We have two of these uh, crew transfer vessels. We have one right now that support the operations of those two turbines. But think of them as the Uber, right? They're going to move people and goods back and forth, back and forth to from shore to the wind turbines. So those are crewed by uh, four people, and then they can take up to 28 people in and out as they go. The next vessel is called a service operations vessel. 
it's just like any other large vessel. Um, you'll have, um, that's where your offshore wind technicians will live, warehouse technicians on the boat, and then the crew that operates it. They'll do two week deployment. So two weeks on, two weeks off. So they never get vacation because they get two weeks off every month, right? But they're on two, two weeks and they're gonna work 10 to 12 hour days. And so they'll be uh, uh, well remunerated. But uh, this is a new design with the vessel. So traditionally what would happen is a crew transfer vessel would pull up here with this big bumper on that transition piece. And then they have to walk off of that, step onto a ladder and climb up about a uh, hundred feet, okay? That's the most dangerous part of offshore wind work is making that transition and getting up there. So this new design, you can see there's a tower in the middle and an articulating arm. So it's a stairwell is what that tower is. So you just climb the stairwell, that arm goes over and attaches to the platform there at the top of the transition piece and you just walk to work. So it's a really interesting vessel. It certainly will be, have all the modern amenities. Each person has their own little studio room. I mean, it's small, right? It's gonna have a bunk and a shower and a bathroom, a little sitting area. There'll be a uh, galley for eating. There'll be a gym and there'll be um, like a, a room for if people wanna take online classes, if they, they'll have rooms with screens in here like this so people can stream movies or do video games during their off time. Uh, and all of these vessels will be Jones Act compliant. The one thing that has not existed until Dominion Energy's parent company uh, made a determination uh, to build an offshore wind turbine installation vessel, the Charybdis. It's being built in Brownsville, Texas. It's being built with American steel that was made in West Virginia and Alabama. Um, same thing with the Crest vessel you see there. It's being built in Wisconsin. Um, one thing about Jones Act, uh, U.S. kill lay, U.S. kill made, U.S. Uh, US made, U.S. owned, operated, and flagged. So uh, that's what we have. If you think about it, it is a massive jack-up platform, right? So that's what this is. And it is capable of lifting those towers. And the, I'm, I'm remarked about the overhead clearance. So those towers are about 450 to 500 feet tall. And you think you got 30 or 40 feet of uh, freeboard from the water up to the deck. So when they go out, you can see why no overhead restrictions are pretty uh, important as you go and do it. But they can load up three towers, excuse me, for this one, you can load up four towers, four of the nacelles and four sets of blades. Keep in mind those blades are loaded in there 108 meters or end zone to end zone, basically going down the Chesapeake Bay before they come out to sea. You'll have a typical uh, operating crew uh, that will be doing the installation of around 70. The vessel can take 119 people on board. So the balance of those people are the folks that operate the boat, if you will. All of these boats will be home ported right by the control center. There's a dock there that they'll all be tied up to and serviced when they're in port. So I want to start now and I want to shift a little bit towards reliability. And, um, you know, Dominion Energy has for a long time had really nice uh, growth for our electric customers. So that growth has been around 2% a year. It's a little above average for the, the company, but we've got a pretty robust economy. You can think of the past years, how we've uh, been rated as one of the top states to do business in. We've got some dynamics that are going on and two, two key factors are driving this. Electrification of appliances and vehicles, right? Is a huge thing. Just to give you an idea, if you plug in the largest uh, battery capacity F-150 Lightning, that's the equivalent energy needs of a small elementary school, okay? Mm -hmm. So think about in your street, if you pile a lot of those on, mm -hmm. what that's going to do to the electric demand. Okay. Also, data centers, tremendous. Used to be data centers were one story and took about 60 megawatts. Well, now they're going to be building four and five story data centers, and they're going to take about 600 to 700 megawatts of energy to run each one of those, okay? So pretty pretty significant growth that we have. 
And what that's changing is from a 2% uh, growth rate up to a 5% growth rate as we go forward. So pretty, pretty uh, tremendous change from what we've had. And it is going to take an all of the above approach. And so what does all of the above mean? That means we're going to need to be able to use what renewables we have. We're going to need to keep our current power stations operating longer than was originally envisioned. And then we're going to have to look at new nuclear and we're going to have to look at additional natural gas resources so that we can meet the needs of the customers. Because wind is a very great resource. So if we talk about the economics of wind, so over the first 10 years of operations, it saves $3 billion worth of fuel costs for customers. Okay. And that's at the traditional fundamental curve where you have natural gas. Well, in the past few years, natural gas has been up substantially. And if you actually, that were to become a new fundamental curve, you're going to end up selling, saving between six to $7 billion of fuel every 10 years. And the project has a 30 year life. It costs $9 billion, $9.8 billion, but you're going to be saving substantial amounts of that. Uh, and, and it comes into play and being real important. So everyone remember Christmas Eve this year, winter storm Elliot, it's extremely cold and windy. So we've looked at when these polar vortexes come down and you know we've looked at the history of what they've done. Um, they pretty much always include a lot of pretty, pretty hefty winds coming with them as those fronts push through. And what we found by doing the analysis that if that larger sea valve project is built and completed and operated this past December on Christmas Eve, it would have saved $10 million in fuel costs. Because not only is it generating during that time with no fuel costs, but the fuel went from $3 a decatherm up to $90 a decatherm. So you had the spot pricing that was really driving up the cost of fuel to, to operate. So what we've done is submitted plans on how we're going to address that. And there are five different curves. But the most critical point to take home here is we do not want to be reliant on states around us to provide energy, right? Because you don't know what their energy security is and what might happen. So it's pretty important for us to look at plans and make sure that we can meet the needs of our customers. And there are five different plans. And um, really, it's going to take a lot of technological advancements to get there. It's going to take whole economy-wide investments and uh, to move power around in the system today versus how it used to flow in the past, and then the continued supportive uh, policies that we have. So these are the plans that, that are, have been submitted to the state corporation. That integrated resource plan is not saying, hey, we need approval to build this or to build that. What it's saying is, here are some scenarios that we can believe we can achieve to meet our customers' needs over a 25-year period. So that's what the integrated resource plan. Uh, but there's some pretty um, key highlights in it that, that came in with this year's plan that had not been in prior plans. So first off, I'll talk about nuclear, right? So right now, Dominion Energy actually operates seven nuclear units, four in Virginia, two in Connecticut, and one in South Carolina. So we obviously are big fans of nuclear as far as that goes. We just uh, had... The operating license extended at Surrey by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and we just also marked on uh, 50 years of operation there. And uh, right now, North Anna, uh, over in Louisa County, that's pending approval as we move forward. And we've had really great performance of our fleet. Uh, pretty continuously, we rank in the, the, the top decile of uh, nuclear operators looking at cost and safety. So it's extremely important for us to keep our nuclear units operating today. They provide about 30% of the energy for Virginia, okay? But it's very clear that if we're going to move forward, we have to have additional resources that are not renewable and, and intermittent in nature. So what does that mean is that we're going to look at small modular reactors. So that's what this year's plan includes. And it ranges depending on which scenario it is. And the 1600 is about six uh, small modular reactors. 
And then you can see as you get up to there, you're talking about 16 or 17 small modular reactors. Small modular reactors are, are pretty simple. Uh, they're, they're pretty much all uh, really modeled off of, say, nuclear reactors that are in aircraft carriers, right? So very safe to operate, and they can follow load and operate much differently than the traditional nuclear reactors of today that once you start them up, you want them to run continuously until their next outage, okay? Um, other areas that, that we're looking at uh, needing to make investments, um, we recently uh, announced uh, looking at the Chesterfield Energy Reliability Center. There were coal plants there that were shut down. They were, were uh, quite aged and, and it was time uh, for them to, to be shut down. And um, what we're looking at now is putting four uh, combustion turbines there. And what they're going to be there is for those days, like on December 24th, when we need to be able to meet our customers' needs. So they'll actually operate a very small percent of the time, but uh, those need to be built 1,000 megawatts, and that'll power about 250,000 homes. Okay, So that winter storm, Elliot, some interesting facts. We were able to meet our customers' needs because our generators, we take care of them, they operated, and we were able to produce power. Okay, Maryland was struggling. And actually, we had the ability to increase our output, and it kept Maryland from having rolling blackouts. Mm -hmm. Our neighbors to the south did not do that. At Duke, they had three units that didn't start, and they had rolling blackouts in North Carolina. Tennessee had rolling blackouts because TVA had some issues with some of their units starting when it was cold. And it's freeze protection, okay? Typically, it's not that cold. The further south you go, I mean, I grew up just south of Raleigh, North Carolina. It's going to be four or five degrees warmer almost always there than it is up here, okay? So they didn't have freeze protection. And you say, what is freeze protection? Well, you know what the majority of it is? putting a metal building around your turbine so that it breaks the wind off of them and things don't freeze. And then anything that you need to, you can do heat tracing on and keep it warm. So um, the other thing is LNG backup. So for our existing gas plants down in the south central part of the state, I have liquefied natural gas to be able to supply them fuel. When that fuel goes up high, if we've had it bought and stored already, then we take away that volatility. So that's pretty much um, the presentation. So questions. Are you ready for questions? So we'll start with the cost, okay? So um, we wanted to know how much did uh, Dominion invest in it? I mean, you were talking about buying the, but what else have you invested? So, and how long will it take to get a return on that investment? And how much is from the taxpayers? And there's like a tax that's on our bills to help pay for that? So, and does your cost include, I just want to get them all out at one time. Okay. Does your cost include backup power? And um, what is the payback period for capital expenditure? And how much will the cost of electricity increase for customers? So um, let's see, the project costs $9.8 billion. Okay, there's been a little over $1 billion spent to date on the project um, that, that we've done. Um, as far as a payback, being a regulated utility, you, you, there, it's not really done that way. We get a return on the equity portion of the investment. So it's there's not like an IRR or payback on that. It's a return on the equity model. So I don't, I can't really answer that question. Uh, it's, it's not that kind of business model. Well, we're told that uh, that the rate payers are paying for actually building it. That's correct. On a monthly charge. That is correct. And, wow. and the customers will pay for the cost of that. And all the energy comes to the customers, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, on average, it's going to be around uh, 420 to 450 a month over the life of the project uh, for the cost of this project, for the okay. cost of the offshore wind. So then you might be raising your rates if the wind doesn't blow or? No. No, it's a part of a uh, diverse generation portfolio. So let's talk back to those Jimmy Carter days. What did you have as generation? Hydro, the beginning of nuclear, coal, natural gas, and oil, right? So now as we move forward, you're going to still need a diverse generation 
portfolio and you look at how your units provide to make sure that you can deliver that power. And so what are we going to have now? You're going to have nuclear. You're going to have hydro. Okay. You're going to have um, natural gas. You're going to have some of the coal units uh, remaining. And then you're going to have offshore wind. You're going to have solar. And you're going to have battery storage. So it's interesting in those scenarios that I put up, those five cases in the uh, integrated resource plan. And uh, the ones that it naturally selected, if you look at it as the optimum, the ability to get to uh, with the cost, actually were a balance of these renewable resources with adding the gas and nuclear. So, um, you know, Dominion Energy will supply and we self-supply our customers' needs. So that's what we do. We try not to rely on imported energy. Okay. Um, so how about high winds? Is that going to destroy the wind blades? Great question. So we looked at the recorded history of time with uh, winds here uh, at this latitude, back to, to any storm that had been recorded. Uh, and we looked at those wind speeds and then added a safety margin on top of that because you just, you know, I can say that, but you don't know what the next storm will be always. So it can take sustained Cat 2 hurricanes in the design, and it can take Cat 3 hurricane gust for shorter periods of time. So very robust design. If you think about it, these turbines and where this all initially started was in the North Sea, right? Howling winds and just ferocious seas. So they're designed already to be rigorous and to be able to operate and survive in those types of conditions. So what if we had a Cat 4, Cat 5? Do you well, shut them you down? Know, uh, oh, they would be shut down well before uh, a Cat 1 hurricane wins. Um, so, I mean, there's never been a recorded history of really even a Cat 2 up here, right? So there's pretty substantive safety margin in there. Yeah, you can't, you can't depend on that. <laughs> this is true. Okay. Does it, wait, we have questions here. Okay. Does it take oil to uh, turn the turbines and does that leak into the ocean? No, they're direct drive turbines. The only hydraulics on the turbine, uh, the direct drive generators, the only real oil on these turbines uh, is in the hydraulics. So the blade, the nacelle and blades rotate so that they optimize the production in the wind, right? And those are hydraulic pistons that push it and then also reset it. So it can go around a time and a half, and then the cables that connect it have to unwind. And so those are hydraulically driven. So a very small amount of oil in that hydraulic system. And there's no way to prevent that from going into the ocean. So there are multiple layers of protection. So uh, it's gonna be in a double wall container, that oil, and then it's gonna go to the hydraulic pistons that would drive that. So it would be pretty difficult to see how that would get into uh, the sea. Okay, so what is the water depth of the turbine? How deep are the foundations driven? So yes, into the, base the of depth the ocean? of the water in the wind energy area is 80 to 120 feet. And the foundations typically go in around 160 to 100, 180 feet down into the sea floor. That was a concrete island sort of thing. It was steel. Oh, the so steel they're still, steel. it's plate steel, they roll the plate, and I didn't grab one, I usually do. The steel is as thick as a dollar bill is long. And so when they put these together, they roll them, pick them up, and there's a person welding on the inside and a person welding on the outside uh, at the same time as they uh, okay. build these. So that's the problem. Yeah. I thought you showed some picture earlier of concrete. Oh, those were the pilings for PMT so that they can take that weight bearing. So those were the concrete pilings. Right. So it's pre-stressed concrete. They those pipe pile. It's a great big thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. How does the wind turbines compare to underwater wave motion generator? There is a system that operates using water, very high output. What happens in heavy weather, fog, ship collisions? Yeah. So I'm not really aware of any underwater current installations other than I know one time in Northern Europe, there was a small one. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know how that compares. I can say that the levelized cost of energy for offshore wind is more than a simple combustion turbine. 
is roughly on par with the cost of a combined cycle, and it's a little bit less than uh, new small modular reactors. And then, so for fog, there'll be, so there'll be lighting on, on the structure. So right around sea level, you're going to have marker lights, just like you would have anything out there. Uh, so that any vessel navigating the area can see them. And the wind turbines also act as a safe haven if some mariner had issues. So they're able to get onto them if they need to. Um, so there will be low-level lights around the water level so that, that people can see those. And then there'll be aviation lights. But the technology is there now so that there'll be a few of those on interspersed to mark the wind energy area. But unless an aircraft is flying directly over it, they won't all light up. Mm -hmm. So that's how you look at mitigating light pollution uh, for those types of things. Okay, so there's a couple of questions here on the dead whales washing ashore um, and marine life and turtles and fishing. So could you like um, talk about any um, adverse reactions to wildlife? Yes. So I'll start with fishing first. I was out yesterday, it was, like I said, my 32nd uh, turbine tour, and there were seven boats out there fishing around the foundation. So these pilings go in, and then you have the transition pieces. Well, around each one of those are roughly three train cars of two to three foot boulders to be scour protection. So what does that do? That creates a tremendous artificial habitat. People were pulling, uh, flounder and black sea bass off. When we do our unmanned submersible uh, work, you can see all sorts of marine life from bait fish at the top of the column, all the way down to juvenile sea bass in those rocks as they grow. So I used to fish out of Moorhead City. And you know, kind of the mid-Atlantic's a sandy desert, right? There might be some wrecks and a few rock outcroppings. But what these are doing is creating artificial habitats. People can go and fish right up to them. We ask that they not tie off to them, their private property. But you probably don't want to get that close because steel and fiberglass don't mix real well if you're 27 miles offshore. And the steel is, I'm pretty sure, going to always win in that case. So you need to, most people anchor up 25, 30 feet away from the wind turbines, and then they cast to the base of the turbine and let their bait uh, sink. So turtles, um, you know, these are really just stationary objects that are out there when they're operating. So there's not a whole lot of interface with turtles and other sea life uh, as that goes on, as, as far as that happens. I see jellyfish out there, and this is the time of year now we're going to start seeing loggerheads and leatherbacks come in to eat the jellies, right? I mean, that's just what they do. They follow their food. Uh, so you're starting to see a lot of the little jellyfish out on the last couple of trips I've been on. And I've seen a couple of loggerheads, haven't seen any leatherbacks, but that's also one of the reasons that we're using the horizontal directional building. Uh, drilling starting a half mile offshore because we don't want to disturb the ecology of the near shore environment. And that's why we'll come up behind the dunes with those cables. So if turtles are nesting or those types of things, they won't be bothered about it. Well, so let's talk about wells. Uh, you know, there's been a lot, lot said about wells. And um, there were a couple of well deaths this year, and those were pretty much attributed to ship strikes, right? There were no offshore wind vessels working during that period of time in Virginia, so they can't be affiliated with offshore wind. Um, you know, there have been some other ones to the north of us. Uh, the interesting aspect is that in one particular state that highlights a lot of it, there's no offshore wind activity up there right now. So the correlation doesn't seem to be there. Is it something that needs to be studied and we need to be sure of? Definitely, right? That's why there's robust studies. And also, um, anytime we're doing work out there, there'll be observation boats, like a picket line around the entire area. And that will have protected species observers on it, looking for marine mammals and marine life. And they can immediately stop all the activity at that time. Okay. A um, couple of questions on the corrosion of the blades. I mean, will they, because of seawater and stuff, will there be any kind of corrosion? And how long do the blades last? When you decommission them, do they get recycled? So blades, they're fiberglass, right? Just like a boat. So as you can imagine, right now, blades are lasting 30 years in Europe, okay? And that they're lasting the life of the assets. Uh, will there be times that you might need to, uh, you know, if, if 
uh, there is some delamination or something of a gel coat, you might need to put new gel coat on and some individuals gonna get to be hanging about 600 feet up in the air and they'll apply new gel coat and cure that to do it. Uh, as far as beneficial reuse of wind turbines, uh, there are new blades that are being designed. Number one is that are recyclable. They are fiberglass. The current beneficial reuse is to grind them up into small pebbles and to put in things like flooring and those types of things are, are the beneficial reuse. So that's what's uh, going on with the offshore wind turbine. Blades. Would they be recycled here or overseas? I don't know the answer to that. That's going to be like 35 years from now. And also the question is what kind of technology might be there for reuse at that point in time as well. Somebody suggested using solar panels on the support columns on all sides would be beneficial. Yeah, so, you know, we've kind of looked at that, but if you think about environments where you're going to have more sustained heavy winds, is that really the right place to be attaching something that, let's just say if it did break loose, might hit a blade and damage the blade in the operation of the wind turbine? And really... Uh, you would really just get the energy out of the south side of that. You wouldn't put it on the north side. So it's a pretty limited area if you think about it going up and down, considering it, uh, what it takes to generate a megawatt of solar energy. How much storage do you have on land? How long do, does it stay? And would there be any um, security in place to protect against terrorism? Or Yeah, so storage right now from a battery storage we have three pallet projects underway, and that's gonna be close to about 30 megawatts spread around the system at a couple of key points. But we do have the United States and realistically the world's largest operating battery today. It's our Bath County pump storage unit, right? And batteries are great things. They can store energy for times when you need it, okay? So Bath County is, is just massive. But you also get constraints when you have like extreme cold and hot weather. You can't recharge those storage. So on that December 24th, the grid operator, PJM, would not let Dominion Energy send energy there to repump uh, up to the higher reservoir to recharge that battery. Same thing with uh, lithium ion batteries today. Uh, during that time period, the, the peak load was at 0400, four in the morning. Well, if batteries have been running since it was dark, they discharge in four hours with lithium ion. So they would not have been capable of supporting that. So batteries are great things. They're just not the be all end all as you go forward with that. Um, how, about, yes. how about the impact of bird migration? So another good question. So there were two years of studies with people out on boats looking for birds in the wind energy area, right? Uh, so you start with that technology of, of people out there being at servers and, and tracking. And one thing that was very clear as we looked at it is that birds tend to stay three miles or closer inshore. I'm not going to tell you that an albatross or a petrel won't be further offshore, but in my 32 trips out there, I've seen one petrel and that was about halfway out. Came out, checked out the boat and left, right? So we don't see a lot of birds. We've got two technologies that are continuing and track that with these demonstration turbines, these pilot turbines, right? So what do we have? We have a LIDAR system that as anything approaches the, the turbine blades, it starts taking pictures and we have not had a bird impact yet. The other thing we do is we put monitors on top of the turbines and where the birds are tagged with the RFID chips. If anything comes along out there that's, that's tagged, it'll pick that up. And we're really not getting readings off of that either. So there's just very few species. And if you've ever been offshore fishing or you were in the Navy, you know, out in the middle of the water, there are very few birds. Okay. Um, the SEC failed to get a performance standards on this project in 2022. Eight multinational companies in three states have backed out of wind contracts due to cost problems. This little one question, BEPCO's stockholders are <laughs> projected, but not ratepayers. Only VA has this happening. Why is BEPCO having a knife to our throats? <laughs> so I will say there's a very big difference between a regulated utility bill in this and the surety that we took to go and get that fixed price slide that I had up there previously. And if you remember when I talked about it, kind of the elephant in the industry is these companies all came over here 
bid up the price for leases and then had to subsequently to be the winner of that and keep increasing the price there, lower their price for their power uh, purchase agreement. So um, that's a very different scenario. When you look at the actual ownership cost of the project over its life, a regulated utility model is much less expensive. A PPA is gonna start out at a price uh, the same or a little lower than ours, but it's gonna have um, an index on it every year that's gonna take that price up typically two and a half to 3%. So by the time you're about five to 10 years out, those curves cross and the cost of the PPA goes up. Companies will also only do uh, PPAs for 20 years, not 30 years for the life of the project. So then what do you do to replace that capacity? You have to build new generation online. You have to go and, and find a way to, to get that generation to be able to meet uh, your customers. And it's a little risky when you're saying you hope you can negotiate something that's a good deal, right? So uh, that's why as, as the evaluations were done here, uh, it came out that it was uh, a better economic uh, uh, situation for our customers for Dominion Energy to build it versus taking a power purchase agreement. That's because the, the rate payers for taking all the risk. All of those other companies, there is risk that they are having to take. Only the General Assembly stuck the Virginia rate payers paying for that where Dominion and Dominion stockholders are not going to get stuck holding the bag. So there are... Uh, cost protections and the cost of the project uh, as that goes forward. How can we tell? Because so much of the projections and everything else, you either had to sign a non-disclosure agreement or an SEC, that's it. Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of questions here on BEPCO. Hiding the true cost, the uh, SEC reported a level needs cost of energy calculation, only the SEC non-disclosure agreement signed. Can you get it? I... So in the public testimony in the case, we talked about the levelized cost of energy and how the cost would flow through the customers. And that's in the public uh, and the then public the testimony. And that that uh, huge amount of it, it was It would be okay. in, the, in the film that's in the recorded session, so. Okay. Uh, why isn't BEPCO worried about copper supplies? We get 40% in Peru, Chile, well, and as, lithium, as, cobalt in the Congo, in China. Or... So as I mentioned, uh, we went out early on and secured our supplies. So that's why we're not seeing the volatility of these um, <clears throat> these prices that others are seeing right now with inflation and uh, high interest rates. So we went out and made our purchases and where there was commodity risk, we went and hedged that and fixed it. So that's why we don't really have a concern with the cost of the cables and the copper. Okay, you have nothing to do with the Kitty Hawk project. We do not, right. that is a uh, yeah. party's project. Right, it's just two separate things, right? So um, you're going from Camp Pendleton? Yes. To Oceana? To, we're going from Camp Pendleton to Oceana Underground, and then from Oceana to Fentra Substation uh, Overhead. Right, okay. You're gonna use <coughs> this team, uh, You're gonna use in the existing uh, transmission lines? Actually, we're not. We're not. We'll, we'll put new lines in, uh, we worked with our engineers so that they didn't have to widen those right of ways. So instead of the big old tall lattice structures that are out there today for most of those lines, they're going to be monopoles with two circuits on each one of them. Is there any technology that operates turbines? If so, what about cyber attacks that shut down the turbines? So just like any other generating resource that we have, this is a NERP. Um, which is the National Electric Reliability Council asset. So there are certain standards that we have for physical and cyber security. It's no different than any other generator we have, right? And the fiber optics to get out to that turbine are all going to be buried about eight feet below the seabed uh, inside the cable uh, that brings that power ashore. So we're going to operate these just like we do our other generating resources. I'll clearly tell you there's a lot of surveillance equipment out there 
that working with our friends at DOD, as you can imagine, that's not going to be publicly available because people don't need to be able to see when vessels are coming in and out and track those kind of things. So a uh, lot of surveillance, but uh, that won't be publicly available. Okay. It says here, um, return on offshore wind is becoming more and more challenging. Shell CEO, uh, something, I can't read that, told Barron's in June they can't earn six to eight what so why invest financially the industry is teetering Bepco said no increase offers a couple billion other industries players indicate 40 b increases 40 percent increases so i'll go back to what i said on our cost slide right we we had to have surety before we went to the state corporation so we can talk about the schedule and the cost of the project and make our commitments to being able to build for that. And when we would bring it on board. These other parties did not go out and secure their supply chain after they did those initial bills. Mm. So that's the big difference there. So that's why, you know, it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges with the, the behavior of two different companies. Okay. So are you secure in, in that this project is going to happen? Because the question is, if the project doesn't happen, happen, would we still have to pay for the cost? So if we don't build it, then that cost wouldn't be incurred and that wouldn't be passed to the ratepayers. And we we can't do that. Right? So there's other no other private investors in this? Not at this time. So if you stop the project, we would still be on the hook for everything up to that point. Yeah, just like any other project that the company would do, right? Right. Yeah. No, so unlike other companies that take some of the risk, Dominion Energy is not taking the risk. It's the right there. Well, so, you know, just like it's a regulated utility model, so that's the case. But you would have substantive cost if another company had planned to build a generation resource at this time and what we would have to do to replace that in a short period of time. I don't know what that cost difference may or may not be, but it's not that there would be no cost. Okay. Um, so um, when we get out of our GGI, you just got it where first we weren't paying for that and now we are paying for it, but now we're coming out of it. What's right. going on with that? So um, the governor has moved forward and made the decision that the Commonwealth will no longer participate in Reggie. So uh, we held off on that while we were trying to get a resolution of it. Uh, we got resolution now. It's not that there were costs that were incurred the first couple of years that are being uh, recovered now. So that's the status. And as we know it right now, uh, we'll no longer a part of Reggie. So we're only paying in it now until we pay back when we weren't paying yes, while we uh, exactly put the money right. in there. When that's done, that's done. Okay, so you listed all the jobs created uh, by this project, but this project replaces existing power plants, natural gas, coal, how many jobs are lost there? Uh, most of the jobs in building the project or maintaining the project. So the Hampton Roads Alliance uh, engaged Mangum Economics out of Glen Allen, Virginia. Uh, to do a study of jobs for offshore wind. And so if, when they looked at it, it shows about 1,500 people working at max during construction. But then they're saying there'll be somewhere around 1,000 jobs during the operations and maintenance phase over the life that'll be supplying goods and services. Remember, you got boats coming and going. You got parts that you're going to have to get. So when they did their economic model, they're looking at around 1,100 jobs long term. They think that would be a steady state. Ah, okay. So who are the main stockholders in the company that is building the turbines in the U.S. and major stockholder, whatever? How? They're asking because they want to know if these are U.S. companies and can we control them? So we're the major company that's building this, right? And we have those suppliers up put up, Siemens Gamesa, EEW, Black, Simco, Demi, and Prismium. They're European companies. Mm -hmm. They have U.S. offices and operations, but they're European companies. There is no offshore wind manufacturing per se today in the United States. You have a lot of plants that are being built so that they can be manufactured here, 
many of them in New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And then we have the blade finishing facility here. PJM4 trends putting electrical grid reliability by 2030. One is intermittent and limited duration resources. What are you, BEPCO, doing to alleviate this? I'm not sure exactly I understand. I don't know who asked the question. I, I just read it exactly what they said. So if somebody wants to ask that who wrote the question. No. OK. And then this one over here, um, at start of 2021, according to U.S. Energy Info Agency, CO2 admitted to provide electricity grew by 3.7 million tons. This focus to import a lot more increasing energy costs, uh, 11% or... 13 or 130 million megawatts import upon went from 2020, 14 million megawatts to 39 million in 2022. I don't know. Did yeah. you write them? Yeah, the for the PJM, there were four trends that they said put four our trend. electric grid, grid liability as a higher issue in seven years. And one of those are intermittent and limited duration resources, What, which is what this is. Okay, so that puts our grid at risk. What are you actually doing to alleviate that risk to take care of the intermittent issues with solar, wind, and that kind of stuff? So that's where small module reactors and natural gas plants come in to fill the gap when those intermittent resources aren't producing, then they'll fill that gap. What about nuclear? Small module reactors, uh, nuclear. So yes. you're not doing regular nuclear, you're doing those. Yes, too. yes. Okay. So it's, it's a quarter after eight now. So if, if you're going to hang around, maybe some people would like to ask you some questions afterwards. There for John. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Okay, well, we can we can do the candidates now. We have oh, okay. a couple yeah. of candidates here that uh, may want to speak. Uh, so um, we have Nicholas, right? And Mike, both of you are running for the 96th district. So if uh, you guys would like to come up here and answer a couple of questions or just uh, tell us more about yourself, who wants to go first? Come on, Nick, you were here first. In the microphone, or am I loud enough? Well, I don't know if you're loud enough. That's my loud enough? Do, I, do I need the mic? Uh, yeah. I it's not even on. Um, turn it on. I'm trying, I'm trying, buddy. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Right. I'm right here. So I'm Nicholas Olenek. I'm running as the independent for the 96th district of the House of Delegates. Um, like starting with questions instead of me rambling. Anybody have a question for me? No, I, my emu, my emu is doing well. It's with his boyfriend in um, Cedar Grove, Tennessee. Everybody keeps saying not Nashville, but Cedar Grove. I just watched it and talked to her um, today on the um, phone and video chat. She's with my best friend and she's doing very well. So what yeah. was your platform for running? What are you running? What, what am I running for? Yeah. Uh, I'm running for um, delegate. Oh, but, no, all right. So why? one of the things that came up that I want to talk more about, I talked last time at the other party, was with Mitch McConnell and um, Feinstein, they're getting old and they can't do their job. We need term limits. We don't need an age limit for office. We need term limits. If every person can only serve two consecutive terms in each position, you would never get into a dynastic rule of one position. Like there's no reason people need to be in the government for 40 years at all. We need to get in, get out, be of the people, by the people, for the people, not a single family holding a spot down for decades. 
that's what's going wrong with America right now. You got don't two. Do it. Uh, no, that's what I'm going to go there and do. That's why I want to be an independent, with no party to toe the line for. And I will scream from high mountaintop term limits, term limits, term limits. It's not up to our politicians, it's up to us voters. Don't say they'll never do it. If I get up there and I make them in Virginia have to do it just by being the loud squeaky wheel on this, you'll see who is not for it. Vote them out until we get other people in to do it. It is needed. Teresa? So, Teresa's got a question. Yes, um, I'm probably one of the few people. I We have term limits that call elections. So right now we have a very low voter turnout, especially in our off elections. And I feel like if you make it just that much more easier that somebody says, oh, I'll just wait till they're done. I don't have to worry about it. I feel like it will it will increase or decrease even more the participation. Government isn't supposed to be deciding when you have an office, the voter is. So I'm I'm not for term limits. I think that it was set up really well. If somebody's too old and not doing a good job in office, then you don't vote for them. I get that, but the age shouldn't be how you said they're too old. There should be no age bracket. If you're elderly if but you're still spry, old. you should be able to be in it. What I'm talking about is somebody getting into a position and staying there and wielding the power for so long unchecked. If we just put it to where you can serve five, six terms, but you can only serve two consecutively. Go take a time off, maybe serve in a different spot. But if we do this, that will open it up for more people to participate. We do need to get younger people like me. That's why I'm running. I want younger generations to come out. I'm doing this out of my own pocket with no big party to show you don't even need money to get up here on this stage. You can do this just as a concerned citizen like I'm doing. I, that's okay. half of my thing. Okay. Robin has a question. All right. Uh, I guess we've, what we've got hanging over our head like a big black cloud right now is a $5.1 billion budget surplus at the state level and here in Virginia Beach where it's hovering around $180 billion, million. So we've got all these excess revenues. Mm -hmm. If you get elected to the General Assembly, you're one of 